Good evening, everybody. How are you? Um, okay. <clears throat> Thanks uh, very much for coming out. It is a rotten night out there, and we do really appreciate people coming out to meet us uh, on, 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 our, on our road show. Um, I just want to start because every day of the week we see new applications for charities and we also, uh, our team who uh, deal with you by phone, get queries by email, uh, we deal with, with charity trustees or employees of charities and one thing that I can say that is shared amongst the staff is that we recognise the amazing work that's done by charities uh, in Donegal and the North West but generally speaking. Uh, the amount of public benefit that you provide. And we understand that because you're volunteers, it takes a lot of effort and commitment to deliver that uh, for, for, your, for the, really the community, the people that you serve. And that is something that, that has the staff that are there, something that, that really does inspire uh, what we do. So I, I just want to start off by recognising the work that you do. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what's up here. Um, Everything that I have to say tonight is actually linked into what uh, Elena is going to say, and it's all, it's all relative to the advancing the, the, sorry, the governance code, okay? So everything that you hear tonight is directly linked to the work that you'll need to do when you're filling out your compliance record form. Okay, so a little bit of background. We have uh, nearly 10,500 charities. Uh, we've registered about 35% uh, of them. The other 65%, you would have had a char charitable tax exemption from the revenue in October 2014, and then you would have been placed uh, onto the register. So you've been registered automatically, effectively. So that's about 65%. And uh, nearly 40% are, are companies, are incorporated, so you file uh, with the CRO. We have over 66,000 <clears throat> board members or committee members, and we'll call them charity trustees, okay? Um, we did a study that showed we've over 300,000 volunteers uh, in Ireland volunteering for charities, registered charities, and over 70 million hours annually donated by the public uh, and volunteers to, char to ch registered charities, which I think is, is, is amazing. It shows what we are as, as a nation. Annual reporting, which, as Helen had said, when that was brought in first, so. Uh, for those of you that had the, the CHY number, the first thing you would have had to do was complete your details for the register and then start filing annual reports. The compliance rate started off, I think, around 40% on time and about 50% by the end of the first year. We're now up to over 90% at the end of a year and 70% uh, on time. We'd like that to go higher, but that's the journey, and that's, that's down to yourselves. Um, <clears throat> so the idea first, I suppose, if you were already a charity and you had a tax exemption, the question we would have been asked was why do I have to do this? The idea that it was just an extra burden. And I think it's, uh, as people have done that now, the, what, what the feedback we're getting is that the, the, the charity registration piece and the annual reporting is not a huge amount of extra work per year. But I would like people to start really thinking now about the idea that the register and being a registered charity is a benefit to you and something, an opportunity that you can use. Um, only those involved in Irish charities which have a registered Irish charity number can use the term Irish charity or registered Irish charity. So we hear the word bandied about sometimes, but only you who have a registration charity number can use those terms, okay? And I think it's really important that you publicize those terms. A lot of people are still using their old charitable tax number or what was called a CHY number. That is not your registered charity number. If you check yourselves on the register of charities, you can go on and check on charitiesregulator.ie you'll find your RCN. I'm going to show you where that is in a minute. Um, but it's really important that you start to promote that idea that you're regulated. There are lots of causes and uh, different, uh, whether it's sporting or other things, competing for uh, the public's donations, the public's time. And what they cannot say is that they're a registered Irish charity and that they're regulated. Okay? Sporting uh, can't say that. And a lot of the causes that are out there, they can't say that. You can say that. And that should give the public more confidence in donating to you, okay? Um, so that's that, that idea that the registered charity number and the fact that you're a registered charity acts as a trust mark for donors and beneficiaries. Um, you also receive important updates. So we have a newsletter that goes out every uh, couple of months, events like these and all the guidance that's on the website. The guidance for the governance code is really practical and really useful from how to take minutes. There's a, a whole range of stuff there uh, to assist you. Only registered charities can get access to all of the tax benefits that the revenue commissioners uh, provide. So there was a VAT rebate scheme that's just been started as one example. 
No, you cannot get access to any of those unless you're a registered charity. So the, the charitable tax exemption and the charity, you, you must maintain your registration with us in order to, keep, to get access to those. And also we're seeing a, a growth in the number of um, uh, funding or even donations from corporate, corporates that are going to say to you, where is your registered charity number? So these are all things that you have that other organizations who are not charities will not be able to access. So I'm going to just briefly, because it's important that you know this yourselves, uh, what is a charity? So anyone who, and there are some people here in the audience who are actually in the, pro, per, uh, the process of applying to be a charity. Um, to be a charity in Ireland, you must operate in Ireland. You can operate overseas or outside of Ireland, but you must operate here. Uh, you must have a charitable purpose only, and you must provide public benefit. They're the three criteria, okay? Um, the... So all of you will have one of the purposes that are selected in the Act. There is, uh, historically, there are three main purposes. Um, relief of poverty, advancement of religion, and advancement of education. There is a fourth broader uh, category, which has about 12 purposes, which is very broad. Um, can be anything from animal welfare, protection of the natural environment, uh, promotion of health or relief of sickness, to arts, culture, heritage, and sciences. Um, so you must have one of those purposes to qualify as a charity, or you can have more than one purpose. And you must provide clear public benefit, and I'll explain a little bit about that in a minute. And the other thing is that all income and property must be used to furtherance that purpose. So public benefit requirement, which is something that you have all the time, every year. So the first one is, there must be benefit. There must be an actual benefit. There must be evidence that you're actually providing benefit to the public or a section of the public. And that, public, that benefit must be broad. It must be to the general public or a sufficient section of the public. Okay? So somebody who supports just an individual is not a charity because that's just for one individual. You must identify a group, could be young people or older people, that you're providing your services to, and then they must be able to access your service based on their need. Okay? If you charge fees to service users, you must be very careful about that because you as a board, as a committee, must consider whether any fees that you're going to charge could limit people from being able to use that service by virtue of their means. So somebody, if it's somebody is poor or somebody is unable to pay, that they shouldn't be prevented from accessing your service because of their ability to pay, okay? You also can't put other rules. So for example, if you had uh, uh, intention to provide a certain type of benefit and you wanted to interview every person who wanted to benefit and say, well, we like him or we don't like her, that's an example of something that's unfair, unduly limiting people. So when you're thinking about public benefit, you need to consider these types of things. Um, when we discuss what private benefit is, and this has come back from the governance code queries that, that Elena has been getting, people saying, well, what is this concept of private benefit? So in charity uh, law, private benefit occurs, uh, effectively it's anyone who's receiving benefit from the charity but they're not a beneficiary. They're not a service user, if you like, okay? Any other benefit is considered to be private benefit. And what's required is that that's considered. So I'll give you some examples. Salaries will be considered to be private benefit. Now, most charities that pay salaries need to pay those salaries in order to do the work that they do. Services are contracts that you give. If you're paying rent on your premises and any expenses that you have, or perhaps sometimes gifts are given out, um, in all circumstances, there are three criteria that you must uh, look at. The first one is, is this uh, private benefit reasonable? Okay, so if we're paying salaries, are those salaries reasonable? Do we think about what the salaries we're paying versus maybe, are they benchmarked, for example? Um, are they necessary? Is it necessary for us to pay for this service? Is it going to help advance our charitable purpose? And is it ancillary? So for everything we do, we need to be thinking about that. Are we providing value for money? Um, we should always be looking as well, and one of the things that we have uh, available, all applica applicants use, and I think it's a really good resource, is a conflict of interest policy. So there's actually a template up there that you can use, and there's also a template for a register of interests. What this means is that in the course of your work, and particularly if you're a community organization, you will have conflicts of interest, okay? But it's important that you uh, declare those, okay? And you can do that through your register of interest or at your meeting, okay? So uh, you should all have a conflicts of interest policy. 
So for those who are applying, this just gives you an example of the type of information that we require. I'm not going to go into this too long, you'll, you'll get the slides. Um, but this is the type of information that's required from somebody who's applying. And I suppose what I'm saying to you is, I had said to you already about the benefits of being a registered Irish charity. For those who want to become one, the process is quite rigorous. They could end up being interviewed by us, they will be asked for quite a lot of information, and we will assess that information. And that, that's important. It's important that we can, we are, we can assure uh, those charities that are ex in existence that anyone who comes to join and become a registered charity has gone through a reasonably rigorous process, okay? And these are the documents that they'd be required. So constitution and financial accounts, conflicts of interest policy, risk assessment procedures, and that's really important. And if you are uh, at the moment providing services which require you to have a safeguarding statement or safeguarding procedures, while that's uh, not in our direct competence, it's really important that charities who are providing those services have the correct policies in place and the correct procedures in place. Um, so they're the type of documents that are required uh, in order to, to, to make that application. Uh, for charitable status. And you might be asked for more if you have property, if, you have, uh, if you're advancing religion, you'd be asked for a lot more information. Okay, <clears throat> so this quote here is from the Dalai Lama. And the reason I'm putting it up is just to say to you that transparency is really important, that where you're telling people, uh, really where you're showing people what you're doing, it, may, it gives confidence and trust back. And the first way you can do that is when you're having your meetings, as Helen has already said, and Elaine will say, you must write it down. Write down your decisions and have a record of them because we can't be transparent if we don't have that in the first instance, okay? And the second one is making that information accessible. It doesn't have to be every piece of information. I'll give you some examples now of good, good types of information to make accessible to the public. Okay, so you all have an entry on the Register of Charities. And you can all go into our website and find your entry by searching through your name or using your number. I assume most people would be familiar with this. So your name is on top and then you have your registered charity number. This is, I, I can't use the flicker, this is this here, okay? And it normally starts with 200 or 201. That number is the number you should have on all your headed paper and on your website and you should be saying to everyone, we are a registered Irish charity because that's what differentiates you from all the other causes, okay? Shows your status, you have in your left your identifiers. Here you have the purpose for which you're authorized. So whatever purposes or you have will be here. And then you have your char charitable objects and that comes from your constitution. There are two tabs over to the right which deal with finance and activities documents which come from the annual return you do each year and the people who are running and the length of time they've been there, that's what's over on the far right, okay? Um, so, <coughs> so, before, so the main thing I, I wanted to draw your attention to is the charitable objects and where that comes from. That comes from your constitution and what I would say to you is this is the um, document that we in the charities, uh, it's actually fallen apart, but in the charities regulator use, that's our act and we have to consult that every day because that tells us what we're able to do, what we can do, what we should be doing. We, we, uh, it is absolutely essential in order for you to advance your charitable purpose, which is a legal duty as trustees and also part of the governance code, okay? You can only do that if you know what your purpose is. If you know and understand what your purpose that you've been set up for. And you, the only way you're gonna know and understand what the purpose that you were set up for, because it may have been set up by other people, you may not have been the people who set up the organization or the registered charity initially, is by reading your own document, which starts with your main object. So the top of every charity's constitution, you will find a main object. And that is really important that you know and understand that as a board and that you can, you can follow, make sure that the work that you do is in line with that. And if it isn't, there are processes then you can do to, to change that. In terms of what we like to see is four kind of key things. The first one is what you're set up to achieve. The second one is how you will do it. Okay, the third one is who will benefit from your work, so it could be, a, that's who the section of the public are, and where will the benefit be provided? So will it be provided in Donegal, or will it be provided nationwide, or will it be provided overseas? So you should put all of that into your main object. In your, uh, your governing document, or your constitution, you will also have your powers, which tell you what you're authorised to do or not authorised to do. We had a situation where um, somebody had, was lending money uh, to another charity 
And actually, they didn't have the power to do that. And they hadn't checked to see whether they had the power to do that. Okay? So you must make sure that you know what the powers of your constitution say so that you, when you make a decision that you're sure it's based on what you're able to do. Um, and also make sure that your or meetings are all organised properly, your AGMs. Again, your constitution would normally have a provision on how people are elected, who has voting rights, how to run an AGM, and what to do if you're thinking of closing down. Okay? So all of those things, it's really important that you know what's in your constitution. You have an obligation with us to make sure that you keep your, uh, the register up to date, okay? And what that requires is that your, um, if, you, if your trustees change, you keep that up to date. If you change bank accounts, if you change the locations you're operating from, you need to fill out a, 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 go online and fill out a form, and some of that information will immediately appear up on the register. Okay, certain changes require our consent. If you want to change your name, that requires our consent. And if you want to change your purpose, because as time goes on, you might want to go into something different from where you've started. You again need to, to get our consent to do that. <coughs> so, this is the other tabs that were there, which I showed you originally. So finance and activities. Um, if you've been filing for four or five years, every year it will show your gross income and your expenditure, the average number of employees and, and, and volunteers that you have. Um, we also uh, now have the sources of income, which is up here, so where it comes from central government or local authorities, from other public bodies or donations. And then you have a, a, your ability to put in a description of what you did last year. And that is really important that you do that. We, we've heard recently of a, a, a charity uh, where a, a, a philanthropic donor uh, gave them a, a reasonably big donation. And what happened was they originally came onto our register looking for a certain type of organization. They found that organization, and there was a link which you can put your website up on the register as well, so that is something you can fill in into your locations. They went onto their website, and they found that they had published their accounts. And when they read the accounts, they were very impressed with what they saw. They made contact, and ultimately that's led to them getting a donation, a fairly si sizable donation. So the information that you, you have up there is actually seen by people. people about three to 400 people a day are visiting the register to look to see are there worthy causes that they can support and volunteer to. And it's really important that you use the register then as a window, um, linking it back to your website and on your website having your further information. Many uh, charities have been putting up what's called, or, or uh, filing what's called abridged accounts. This is a, a, a much uh, smaller set of accounts that don't really tell you a whole lot of information. This practice, which has grown over the last two or three years, while not illegal, um, does no good for anyone in terms of being transparent and open because it limits down the amount of information. You wouldn't, for example, know how much money the, the charity had taken in and where it had spent its money. So I would advise all of you to check your accounts if, uh, and to make sure that if it says abridged, you're not filing that or publishing that on your website, that the format of accounts you're providing is the full set. It's not a huge extra task because as a board you would have actually seen the full set. It's just the presentation format is a lot less information. Publicize that you're a registered charity and your RCN number. That's really important because you're differentiating yourself from all of the other types of organization who might be competing. And we would suggest that you put the link to your entry on the register on your website, on your social media so people can see that. Okay? Because the, 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 we have done some work that shows people are very aware that the charities regulator exists and that charities are regulated. And that is something that, if you're, that you should really use as a, as a way of promoting the work that you do. Um, so I'll finish off by just saying to you that uh, for a lot of you, there's annual report deadline is now due. And uh, the, the, the final date is 31st of October. There are a few steps, so you have to log on to the portal and you've got to make sure that you can get, get onto the form and then file it. So please make sure somebody may, who is dealing with it may have changed since last year. Don't leave it to the 29th or 30th of October. Uh, get onto it as soon as you can. The other thing is if at any point you have a question or a query or you're stuck, make a phone call. Our number is 01633-1500. Our phone lines are open from 10 to 5 every day. We have very uh, knowledgeable and helpful staff. They are there to help you. They're dealing with charity trustees every day. They know your time is precious. So please pick up the phone. Um, there's no query that you can give that we haven't uh, been able to answer before. All right, so that's for me. Thanks very much.